Hey, everybody out there in internet land, thank you for joining us today for this virtual training. Uh, my name is Brian Fitzgerald, and today's presentation will be on the installation of glass tile in pools. While we will be heavily focusing on glass tile, a lot of the concepts we're talking about today will directly translate to other types of tile as well, porcelain and ceramic. Uh, and to give you a little bit of background on myself as to why I am uh, qualified to talk about this topic, uh, I started working in the tile industry right out of high school. I was about 18. I started going out on jobs with my older brother, who's a tile contractor, still is. And I started out as a helper. Worked my way up, uh, you know, about a little over a decade later, about 12 years later, I was a foreman for a high-end installation company with aspirations of going out on my own and starting my own company. And, uh, and well, my back decided it didn't want to do tile anymore, and I exploded a disc. So at the age of 30 years old, I had to look around and decide uh, uh, what else I was going to do. And luckily, I found a, a company, Oceanside Glass and Tile in Southern California. They were looking for people with installation experience to work in their technical services department. And I took a job with them, and I've been there for about 14, going on 15 years, and now I'm the uh, product and technical services manager. In my time with the, this company, I have worked on the ANSI A108 committee, which is the Tile Industry Standards Development Committee for both material and labor standards, as well worked on the Tile Council of North America Handbook Committee, where I was an integral part of the development of the P602 method, which covers the installation of tile in pools, not just glass tile, but tile in pools. So I have a pretty unique background and uh, cross between field experience and industry standards and manufacturing knowledge and expertise. Uh, I'm intimately familiar with all of our man manufacturing techniques for glass tile that we use uh, and the things that, that can and, uh, and the things that you need to look for in a glass tile to make them a quality product and how they're made. So, all right, let's jump right into it. So the, the table of context and kind of learning objectives for today. So first thing I want to say is, in an hour presentation, I, I can't make you a pool expert. I can't make you uh, an expert uh, glass tile installer in an hour presentation. That takes years of experience and practice and actually going in the field and doing those jobs. What I'm hoping to do is give you a good base of knowledge, of technical knowledge that you can lean on when you go out into these fields and work on these jobs. So hopefully you look at these jobs in a new way, maybe take away some of the fear you had of working with glass, because now you know at least the questions to ask, to, to look at the material and what you're looking for to make sure you're not getting in over your head and gonna have a problem with the job. So we're gonna talk about glass tile selection. What are you looking for in a glass tile to make sure it's the right product for you? We're gonna talk about everything on the job site from pre-installation prep and inspection, substrate preparation, which is in, in my opinion, the most important part of this, this, uh, this presentation. We're gonna talk about the actual tile installation process, uh, the materials that go into that, things to consider with, particularly with translucent tile. We're gonna talk about movement joints and then briefly talk about maintenance. And then of course, we're gonna look at some really pretty pictures of some very cool pools I got installed. So uh, right, first things first, glass tile selection. Uh, what are you looking for in a tile? What makes it a good option? All those types of things. So we're gonna talk about mosaic mounting types. The majority of glass tile going in pools is mosaic. So we are gonna heavily focus on mosaics and mosaic mounting types and installation. Talk briefly about trim options, physical properties. What are the things that make a good glass tile versus a bad glass tile? And then uh, the installation instructions that you should be getting with the product when you make that selection. So first things first, let's talk about mounting types. This is a great example of probably the most common and ubiquitous mounting type in the tile industry, which is mesh mounting. You're all familiar with it. Tile gets mounted to a fiberglass mesh with glue. Uh, there's pros and cons to all these methods uh, for mounting. Uh, one of the biggest pros to this is it's pretty easy. You're able to see it. It makes sense. People are familiar with it uh, and, and all those things. Uh, it's a little bit faster installed because of that. Uh, but you do have limited adjustment. You are married to the way this tile is on the mesh. Uh, it is the way it is. It's pretty difficult to make adjustments once it's installed. Uh, but also, most importantly, you're in pools, you're bonding to the glue and the mesh and not the entire back of the tile. So you want to make sure that whatever mesh and glue is used on the tile is applied in a way that works, but also is a glue itself that stands up a little bit to water and a, and, a, and a submerged application. And here's a great example of that. Tile on the left here, you can see the back of the tile is 100% occluded with glue and mesh. And um, that, that is not a product I would be scared. If that tile is, or excuse me, if that glue is water soluble at all, when you, what you're bonding to with your adhesive, your thin set, is that glue. And once that glue starts to melt, uh, your tile is going to start falling off the wall. Tile on the right is actually a tile we used to import. And when we first started importing it, the entire back of the tile was covered with glue. And we tested it. It failed miserably in submerged testing. And we went to the manufacturer and said, hey, we'd like to sell you this for pools. But in order to do so, we need to be able to actually bond to the back of the tile. And can you change the way you're applying the glue to just, just put it on the mesh and then lay the mesh on the tile and press it down? So you can see all these dull spots. Let me get my pointer here. And these dull spots here in between the mesh, there's no glue. The little bit of shiny spots there actually is glue. But you're actually getting a good percentage of coverage and bond to the back of the tile. 
We tested it. It did very well. We sold it in pools for a number of years and never had any issues with delamination. So uh, not saying you can't use glue or, or excuse me, can't use mesh mounted in pools, but you do need to be aware how the quality of the mesh. If you're buying product for somebody like a national pool tile, we do extensive work with them. They do a lot of pre-qualification on their products. I would be pretty confident buying a mesh mounted product from national pool tile that they've put it through its paces and it's going to work in a pool. Uh, if I get handed a mesh mounted product from a homeowner and I don't know where they got it or they got it at a big box store, I'm going to question that pretty hard and I'm going to be very, very cautious with that. So something to keep in mind with mesh mounted products. Next, moving on, we're going to talk about face mounting. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to face mount. Uh, all, obviously, face mount, you're putting a mounting on the front of the tile. In this case, we're talking about film face mounting. Film is basically a piece of tape, sticky tape that holds the sheet together. Uh, pros to this, you're able to see the tile while you're installing again. You are now getting 100% bond to the back of the tile. There's no mesh or glue to worry about. But you still have limited adjustment during the installation. And the reason for that is the thin set needs to be fully set up before you can remove this film off the tile or you'll start pulling the tile out of the adhesive. So uh, you have to leave it until your thin set sets up. So you have somewhat limits your adjustment in the field. Uh, you're also unable to completely remove thin set from the joints if you get bleed through as you're going because it's under that tape. And you can't use the back butter method. I can't get into a lot of detail on the back butter method in this presentation. That would maybe be the next level up for uh, for presentations. But there is a method where you can back butter sheets of tile, face mounted sheets of tile with grout, and then set it into thin set. But that really can only be done with paper face mounting. It cannot be done with film. So that's a little bit of a drawback for film if that's something you want to do. So as I mentioned, paper face mounting, this is again, front of the tile. And now you got paper on the front. It's held on with a water soluble glue. And that paper is removed during the installation process. And I'll show you that later. Uh, in this presentation. So the paper's on the front, water soluble glue, you get the paper wet, glue lets go, you can start to peel it off while your thin set is still fresh. So you're now getting 100% bond to the back of the tile, you have maximum adjustability, you can really work for whole tile layout because of that adjustability. Uh, you Again, you can use the director back bond method, you can back butter the sheet with grout if you want to. There's some nuances there, if you're not experienced with it, I wouldn't suggest just going for that without uh, getting some more information. Uh, you also have the option to remount. Remounting uh, is something that really good uh, high-end installers will do with paper face mosaics. You can just go buy craft paper, 40 pound craft paper. Uh, you can go get some uh, water soluble, or excuse me, water-based uh, wallpaper paste from Home Depot, mix up your own glue, and you can remount. So you can take a template at the top of a step that's really complicated, radial pattern, and you can take that, draw it out, take a template, draw it out, remount the tile at your shop where you're right next to your saw, make it really fast, make it perfect. And then when you go back to that job site, you drop that sheet down. It fits perfectly because you templated it and you're done. So that's a, that's another really nice thing with uh, paper face mosaics is if you want to spend the time to do the remount on those complex portions, you can. Uh, it's really easy to negotiate radius and curves because that paper, when it gets wet, it relaxes. Uh, if you're cutting it into strips and working on a radius, a lot of times um, mesh mounted or film face, it's hard to get that curve. You got to slice it. It wants to go back to a, to a straight line, it fights you. With the paper, if you get it wet, it stays in that curve nicely and it, it relaxes. Uh, but there is a learning curve to paper face mounting product. Uh, the first time you work with it, you're probably going to get frustrated. You got to learn the timing of the paper removal. You got to do it when your thin set's still fresh, but not too fresh. Uh, and, you know, set up, but not set up enough. There's a sweet spot. And until you learn that and you get experienced with it, it can be a little frustrating and it can take a little longer. I've been working with uh, paper face mosaics now for almost exclusively for 15 years. And I can tell you, I am faster with paper face mosaics than I am with uh, with just about anything else. And it's just, again, that comfort level and knowledge that comes with it. So it takes a little time. That That's the biggest downside with paper face mosaics. So when I mentioned uh, uh, the, the mesh mounted product before, so this is a little note that comes out of ANSI 137.2, which is a manufacturing standard. And when we were working on that standard, big labor came to us and they had requested us to put in a note that said mesh mounted tiles should not be used in pools. And at the time, there were a lot of uh, failures in the industry and there, I think there were a number of lawsuits as well. And, and there was a big push from labor to say, Hey, we don't want to use these mesh mounted products and pools anymore. And we said, well, as much as I would love to do that as I'm working for a manufacturer who makes almost exclusively face mounted materials, we can't do that. It, it would be anti-competitive. It's not right because there are products out there that can work in pools. You just need to be cautious. So what we ended up co compromising is just a statement. I won't read it word for word. You can read it, but basically what it says is face mounted products, are recommended for exterior and submerged applications versus uh, mesh mounted products and just it was something to back up and give the specifiers something to point to or the builders to say hey we want we want uh, we want face mounted product and this is why versus just just because I'm saying so sometimes it helps to have a little bit of industry backup to point to 
All right, next we'll talk a little bit about glass tile trim. And the big takeaway here is that there is trim. Uh, there is trim available, not just from us, but from a lot of different manufacturers for glass tile. And it's something you need to think about before you order the tile and before you get on the job site. One of the most frustrating phone calls I get is a guy standing in the pool says, hey, I got the spillway, I got steps, I got all this trim. How do I polish the edge? How do I do miters? And I'm walking him through it and I go, well, you know, we have quarter quarter round. It would have made your life a lot easier. And he goes, man, I wish I had known that three weeks ago when we placed the order. Now I got to spend you know, an extra 12 hours in labor and all this time to get a nice trim detail. So you really want to ask the question ahead of time. How are we doing these trim? Uh, how are we trimming these corners? Do Is there quarter round available? Is there trim available? And then if the answer is no, or if the design is no, then you can know to charge appropriately for the labor to not use that. So here's a great example. This photo on the left is from an installer by the name of Steve Martin uh, from Georgia. Tile installer, not the comedian. Steve Martin, really good tile installer. Uh, but you can see here, he did basically miters on all these corners, the, the horizontal and vertical corners inside and out of the spa. I mean, very, very clean work, but that was not easy. And it took a fair amount of time. And I guarantee you, knowing Steve, he had the conversation with the own project owner ahead of time and said, Hey, this is what I need to do. If you don't want to use trim and have this very clean, modern look, this is what I need to do to make it look nice. And here's your options. And here's your charges for, you know, good, better, best options. And they obviously chose best and it looks amazing. But he did that proactively and had the conversation so he could charge appropriately and make sure he was doing it right. So then the upper right hand corner is just an example of a, uh, a quarter round detail with a nice inside miter. Uh, we'll show you a finished photo of that later in the presentation. And the lower side is a, uh, is a different manufacturer. Uh, it's from Island Stone, a good friend of mine there. David Fatula works there. But there's a, um, a quarter round detail on the inside and outside. That's a trim that they make. So we're not the only one to make uh, trim options. They are available again ask the question ahead of time it'll save you a lot of headache uh, and down the road and here's just a couple good examples of, of nice trim details how nice it can look when it's done well the three-way miter there in the right hand corner is a nice touch um yeah just some good trim work very, very clean very very modern very clean looking all right so now getting into the nitty-gritty of of glass tile selection not all glass tile is suitable for pool applications pools are very demanding installations you got heating cooling chemical environment expansion contraction all these things it's 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 a tough place to put tile and then now you're going to make that tile glass so what what are you looking for as the installer as the builder to make sure you're covering yourself and you're getting a quality product you want to refer to the last tile manufacturer's documentation the recommended applications their test results and their instructions you want from the manufacturer in writing that they recommend that tile to go in pools you want the test results to back up as to why they say it can go in pools and then you want the instructions to show you how to put it in pools so if there is an issue down the road, you can point to those instructions and say, hey, here's the materials you recommended, here's the method you recommended, I dotted my I's, I crossed my T's, uh, it's not an installation issue, right? That's that's what you're really looking to do. If they don't publish that information, if they don't tell you the way they want it to go in, then you're left trying to figure it out on your own or referring to industry standard, and there's a lot of gray room there, and there's a lot of wiggle room, and uh, that's not a place you wanna be if things go sideways. So uh, looking for the test results and what you're looking for in physical properties. You're looking for glass to be impervious. Obviously, glass, if it absorbs water, there's something wrong with it. Um, so you want it to be impervious. That's less than 0.5% water absorption. That 0.5 water percent is literally just the, the noise in the test. But you want it to be impervious. You don't want it to absorb water, which makes it freestyle resistant, obviously important for exteriors. High breaking strength. Pools are dynamic installations. Movement, soil movement, expansion, contraction. You need high strength. Properly annealed. Okay. Properly annealed. Um, you can ask the question to the manufacturer, is this properly annealed or not? And you may or may not get a straight answer. But uh, w why is this important? Why is annealing important? There's something in glass when you form it that you, when you take hot molten glass and you essentially freeze it instantly with a mold, whether you're rolling it or pressing it, you're freezing the outside of that glass instantly. The inside is still hot. So you create a shell and then your, your, your gooey center that's still hot essentially slowly cools down and it pulls on that shell as it, as it cools and shrinks. And it puts the whole thing under tension. That's a bad thing because think of a think of a rope between two posts and you have 5,000 pounds of force on that rope. It's it's a guitar string. It's super tight. You just touch that rope with a knife. It's going to explode. Boom, right? Just just a nick and that thing, whole thing's going to go. That's under tension. You take that same rope, you relax it, you take the tension out of it. Now it's kind of just um, draped between the two posts. You can saw halfway through that rope. It's not going to continue to fail under its own power. It takes much less outside force to cause a failure when something's under that kind of tension or stress. So by annealing it, you take that stress out. And all annealing is, it's a fancy word of saying slowly cooling. So you take that tile, it's frozen, it's formed, 
He has all that stress in it. There's no way to avoid that when you make it. But now you got to take that stress out. You put it back into an oven. It heats it up to a certain temperature. It's most mosaics, it's usually around 1,000 degrees. And then it slowly cools it down over the course of several hours. The thicker the tile is, the longer it takes to cool properly. But generally a couple hours, it comes out the other end about 200 degrees. You can handle it with gloves. And you've taken all that stress out of it by heating it back up, getting it all consistent in temperature, and then slowly cooling it so it cools all the way through the thickness at the same rate. You've annealed it. You've taken out that stress. It adds time and cost to the manufacturing process, which is why it's sometimes skipped in the lower quality products. Uh, you're generally looking for face mounted. We talked about that earlier. Eliminate the glue and mesh um, issues. Uh, so paper or film mounted would be my preference. And then you're looking for installation instructions. You're looking for technical, doc technical documentation and also maintenance recommendations. Uh, tile and pools needs to be maintained. You need to know the right way to do it. So your pool guy isn't ruining uh, a $20,000 installation uh, because he decides to dump uh, some acid on it and, and burn it. So we'll, we'll touch on that later as well. But those are the things we're looking for from a manufacturer in terms of installation and including installation instructions. Our instructions here, which I will hopefully be able to include for you guys in some sort of digital handout, uh, covers everything from material inspection, substrate preparation with CAD drawing showing every layer in the installation, cure times recommendations for each one of those materials, uh, recommended materials, specific recommended materials, the actual product name, the brand, uh, and then, you know, movement joint locations, cutting, drilling, all that information. So we try to, you know, put as much as we can in there without making it overwhelming, but give you all the information you need. To, uh, to, to successfully execute that installation. All right, so now getting into the nitty gritty of the actual pool prep and getting getting hands on in the pool. Uh, Pre-installation prep uh, is is important. Uh, you wanna make sure you're doing an inspection at some, some level and then uh, and then either calling out repairs or doing repairs yourself, depending on the, the level, your comfort level with doing that. And then we'll talk about a little bit about site protection. So pre-installation inspection and repair. Uh, the takeaway here is you need to do some level of inspection before you just start throwing tile in. Uh, as a tile installer in general, once you put tile over a substrate, you own it. And if there's an issue with that substrate down the road, somebody's going to say, hey, if there was a crack there, why did you install over it without doing something about it first? Um, so it, it's, it makes your life a lot more difficult when there's an issue. This is a great photo. I love this photo because a buddy of mine uh, was doing an installation on the East Coast and the builder called him and said, hey, I got a spa outside of a spa. It's all prepped. We prepped it for you. Don't worry about it. Just show up and throw the tile on and uh, it's ready to go. I said, well, I'd rather come check it out. So he showed up. He walked around the outside of it, was like, man, this prep looks a little rough. Just started kicking it with the toe of his steel toe boot and uh, found a hollow spot, grabbed a hammer, tapped on it, and boom, what do you know? A nice big chunk of rebound, uh, got some, some soft concrete problems. A uh, mortar bed was hollow in several places. Called the builder back up and said, look, um, I'm happy to put this tile in, but you got to pay me to rip out the substrate and reprep it all uh, the proper way uh, because there's no way I'm putting tile over this substrate and, uh, and you know, because I'm not going to buy the failure. So, you know, whether it's tapping with a hammer, looking for hollows, looking for small cracks, uh, all those types of things, you just want to make sure you're being proactive and looking for them. It's not crazy. We're not going out there with, like, x-ray equipment. But we want to make sure that we know what we're installing on before we commit to doing it. Uh, another thing we look at and we'll be very, very cautious of is the joint between the coping and the top of the bond beam. So let me get my pointer here. So imagine this here is your deck behind your, your bond beam. This is the top of your bond beam of your pool. This would be the inside of the pool here. Uh, this would essentially be your water line. Most of you know, I'm, I'm sure, aware that essentially your, your mortar bed gets applied to the top of this bond beam. Uh, to level it out, you get uh, your coping installed to get a nice level here, and you have a joint between your mortar bed and the top of your bond beam that will eventually be spanned by tile. I'm sure you've all been on the job and you've seen masons come out and do this quipping, and they like sometimes they'll just kick their dirt off with their boot, maybe brush it off with a, a broom if they're really thorough, throw down their mortar and throw down their coping, and they call it good. They don't use any sort of bonding agent, and what happens is you essentially get a cold joint here between your mortar and your coping, and here's a little animation to show you, show you the different levels and what can happen. So imagine that's your mortar bed going in for a coping. That would be your coping that gets installed with your mortar. You end up with a mortar bed going over here for your water line and tile that gets installed over that. Well, if this joint here isn't solid and you get movement, heating, expansion, contraction, a freeze thaw, something bad happens like that, boom, that thing moves, you're going to get a crack. You're going to get a crack right through your tile uh, and that's a problem. So one thing I really pay particular attention to when I walk into a pool and I'm spanning that joint there is I ask the question, how is that coping bonded? Uh, did they use a bonding agent? I'm going to walk around. I'm going to tap on it. I'm going to listen to it. 
is I'm going to look at it. Can I see a bonding agent? And if I'm not 100% confident that that coping is going to hold, uh, I'm I'm going to ask for for something in writing that says, hey, you know, I can't I can't guarantee you that, but if that cracks, that's going to be an issue, right? So, uh, if there's a cold joint there, there's not much you can do. Is your tile is not going to hold it together? Let's put it that way. So let's uh, show you a good example of what it looks like when that happens. So this is a phone, I actually got a phone call on this one. The customer called and said, hey, your tile's defective. It's cracking an inch below the waterline all the way around the pool. I was like, wow, that's interesting. We were able to get all the defective tile in a straight line all the way around the pool. But uh, yeah, of course, we looked at the photos and it was very easy to see. Here's a crack in your substrate, right? These tiles have fallen out. So you can clearly see the crack is behind the tile. It actually continues here behind the translucent tile. It just hasn't cracked the tile yet. They're just starting to lose bond. Um, and it went all the way around. It went all the way around the pool. You can see it. It was very clear as day. In one end of the pool, you could actually see that the coping has started to tent. And uh, we believe the problem was they ended up getting some free saw and uh, a combination of a, a lack of uh, or improper uh, pitching on the deck and uh, not a good enough bond on the uh, on the coping. This whole coping just lifted off the top of the bond beam and it you know tore the tile away with it too. Uh, another thing to look for is cracking. If you have a crack in a concrete tank, it, I'm a tile installer. I'm not an engineer. I don't know if that crack's going to be a problem or not. So what I do, my general rule of thumb is I'm going to report that to the builder and I'm going to have him give me something in writing that says uh, either it's going to be repaired in X, Y, and Z way or it doesn't need to be repaired for these reasons. I'm going to take photos. I'm going to have that in writing because so down the road, if it is an issue, I can say, hey, I brought it to your attention um, and it was up to you to fix it. Obviously, it didn't get fixed well enough because now the cracks come through the tile and I did everything right, you know, from the tile installation point of view because of blah, blah, and blah. Um, you know, it can be everything from, you know, this here, I think was a little bit of water plug that ended up going in the crack. It can be more fancy than that with chasing out cracks and stitching in with epoxy. But again, not my job. I'm a tile installer. That's going to be for the builder to determine. And if the deter if the builder doesn't know, they need to go talk to an engineer and make sure that that's structurally sound. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about site protection. Um, and again, this is all just kind of like before we even get into starting to work on everything. These are the things we're thinking about when we show up and we're, we do our inspection. How are we going to protect it? All these things. Site protection is going to vary depending on where you are and what kind of project you're doing. If I'm in Southern California and it's nice weather out, there's no rain in the forecast for the next two months. Um, I'm not going to really worry about crazy site protection, but I might worry about shade and I might worry about wind blocking. The setting materials we use generally recommend, you know, somewhere between 40 and 90 degrees as their working temperatures. So uh, I need to worry about if it's 80 degrees out, but my surface is sitting in the sun, it's going to be hot. It's going to flash off my thin set. I'm going to get skinning. Uh, it could cause color issues. And when you're talking about translucent tile, color is a, is a concern with your setting material. So you got to be really cautious with those things. So, but it doesn't have to be crazy. This is a, a two by four setup with a sunscreen on it. Could be a pop up tent. Could be a couple umbrellas leaned up. Uh, if I'm working on a water line and there is maybe a little rain in the forecast, I've run visqueen, visqueen around, draped it down in the pool, you know, a foot just to cover the water line to make sure it doesn't get wet. It doesn't have to be crazy. It can be very simple, but it is something you need to worry about. Uh, here's a kind of a next level up of protection. This would be this is an in-ground pool again, Southern California. They weren't worried about rain. It was that time of year. Um, and they were more worried about shade, but it was deep enough that they could just run these shades right over the top, put them on the deck with cinder blocks, clamp them to the, some posts in the trees, and you had nice sunshades and uh, kind of kept the wind out too and kept your uh, thin set from skinning over too quickly. Now, this is the next level up. This would be kind of the other end of the spectrum from your water line. This is an all tile pool. And this is a photo. This is a project you're going to see a lot of photos of in this presentation because it has some great examples of different techniques and, and ideas of the way to execute these things. But this job was in Idaho, I think. And if you look at the trees in the background and in the, in the grass, it's brown. It's fall. Uh, they had finished floating this pool. Uh, they got that done before it got too cold. But they're going to do the installation through the winter. And that's a concern. You got freezing. You got rain. You got snow. So what they ended up doing is they tented this entire thing. Uh, they have it. Obviously, you can see it strapped down. It's very robust. They had to worry about wind and snow load. Uh, and then they also had to worry about climate control. They had electric heaters in here. They didn't use propane because the CO2 from the propane can actually cause issues with carrying your thin set. It's also not great to breathe if you're in an enclosed space. So uh, they they uh, used electric heaters, had this thing, uh, a comfortable working condition and within the tolerances of their setting materials through the entire installation and curing phases while it was snowing and really nasty outside. And here's a, here's a photo of that tent after a little bit of snow on the ground. Uh, and it was totally solid. Uh, I have a photo I think of this is a Greg Andrews pool who if you don't know Greg Andrews He's a great guy Southern California installer great mosaic installer I consider him a friend and a mentor a lot. He lets me use a lot of these photos and I really appreciate it But I actually have a photo of him standing on that that tent roof somewhere 
uh, it's a very robust tent uh, that they built for this for that project. Okay, so that's it for site protection. Now we're going to talk about substrate preparation, which in my opinion is the most important part of this entire presentation. So if you're like the guy who normally sits in the back of the presentation and doesn't, you know, is like skimming through the notes, um, this is that point where I kind of like point you out and make fun of you, but I can't do that because we're on the internet. Um, but now's the time to perk up and pay attention, buddy. Uh, this is this is your moment. So in substrate prep, we're going to talk about uh, three primary things, which is your primary waterproofing, your mortar bed application, and then your secondary waterproofing. That's that's essentially your three layers you're going to get in a pool uh, from your tank out. And here's a, here's a diagram of that. So starting at your concrete tank, you have your primary waterproofing, which we're going to talk about now. You have your mortar bed, uh, which is consisted of two parts, a bomb coat and the mortar bed itself, and then your secondary waterproofing on the top of that, and then that's where your tile gets installed over that. So uh, we'll go through each of those in uh, detail. So first we're going to talk about the primary waterproofing. For primary waterproofing, we uh, recommend a particular type of waterproofing. It's called a penetrating colloidal silicate, a really fancy word, but there are probably products you've heard of, Acuron CPSP, uh, which I think is concrete pool shell protector, Bracecrete, uh, PSPW primary pool shell primary waterproofing and the mirror prime aqua block XL. I think there's one other one on our list. I just don't know it off the top of my head of the ones we recommend, uh, but they're all very similar in the way they work and how their chemistry works. And what they do is you get sprayed onto your concrete tank and it reacts with the alkalinity of the concrete and the cement and it creates a gel within the, the capillary structure of the concrete and it plugs it and it creates a very nice waterproofing. And what's nice about these products is they actually soak into the, the shell to the concrete and they waterproof it kind of within the inside out. So they do a really good job of resisting positive and negative hydrostatic pressure. And to give you uh, an idea of what the difference between those two things are, positive hydrostatic pressure is water that comes from the same side of your application. So if you spray uh, uh, the one of these waterproofings on the inside of your pool, then the water going from the inside of the pool trying to get out would be applying positive hydrostatic pressure to that coating. But if, say, you're doing a negative edge and you just uh, wa waterproof the outside of the negative edge, then you'd have pressure coming from the backside of your application, which would be negative hydrostatic pressure. Not all waterproofings do a good job with both positive and negative hydrostatic pressure. These do. These penetrating colloidal silicates, those three products I showed, they do a really great job with those. Um, and so, uh, and, and that's important, especially in, like I said, negative edges outside of overflows and spas. Here's a great example of somebody or a project where it didn't get good waterproofing. It had some other issues like contact, but you can see this efflorescence here. It's just there's water essentially pouring through this entire wall. A lot of people think, you know, gunny, excuse me, gunite shotcrete is waterproof. It's water resistant. It's not waterproof. Um, and even 4,000 psi concrete, I promise you, water is getting through that. It, you do need to apply something there, and the primary waterproofing uh, does a great job. So this project, you could literally just peel tile off, um, and a big part of that was that constant negative hydrostatic pressure. Uh, causing issues uh, with the tile. So how do you apply these? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. We do often recommend a, uh, a pressure wash before you do anything. I'm sure you guys have been on lots of pool jobs, you know they're not very clean. So doing a good pressure wash is a nice way to, to get all the dirt and grime and stuff off the surface to make sure you're getting good, uh, good application and good bonding in your next steps. But you do want to make sure you don't have standing water. You can work with a saturated surface dry with these waterproofings, but you don't want standing water on the surface. So pressure wash, vacuum, let it dry a little bit. Uh, and then they just they get sprayed on. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you do want to refer to the manufacturer's instructions for things like application, number of coats, uh, timing between coats. You do there is some nuance uh, with the alkalinity of the concrete. So as concrete when concrete's first poured, it's very very alkaline. It's very base. Uh, but as it ages, it gets closer and closer to neutral. These products work by reacting with the alkalinity. So if you have really old concrete that's not as alkaline, you may need to use a secondary product, I think they call it a conditioner, uh, over the top of this to add in that alkalinity and help kickstart that reaction. This stuff works great on brand new, fresh, green concrete because it is so green, or excuse me, it's so alkaline when it's green and new that these products are just, they kick off like crazy and they're magic with those types of products. Older concrete may need to use a conditioner to help it along just because it's, it's lost that uh, alkalinity. So after your primary waterproofing, now we're going to talk about the mortar bed. And like I said, mortar bed is consists of two things. It's a mortar bed and a mortar bed or mortar bed bond coat and the mortar bed. And here's a visual of that. I'll get my pointer going here. So the mortar bed is essentially a mix of sand and cement. Three parts sand to one part cement is our recommendation. No lime because you're using a bonding agent in our, our, our experience. You do not need lime and lime can sometimes cause issues with efflorescence. So if we don't need it, we're not going to put it in our mix. Um, and 
So what you're doing is you're taking taking a slurry of a modified thin set, a uh, basic you know thin set that you'd use to install a porcelain tile. And here the type exact type of thin set is not super critical as long as it's good quality modified thin set. And while this is still fresh, you put it out slurry. You're taking your mortar bed, you're putting that over that and tamping it down. And here this they're working on a uh, horizontal surface, a floor, so they're working with a fairly dry pack mortar here. Uh, but it would be the same thing on a wall, but you just have a, a slightly wetter mortar mix uh, and maybe a little bit more dry slurry coat. Um, to help it hang on the wall a little bit better. So here's a, an example of that. So you have a bond coat on the wall and then mortar, mortar bed getting floated off there. Some float sticks that uh, nice and plumb to get a nice plumb wall there. And this is where you really make your money as an installer, in my opinion, in a pool. A good float job makes the tile installation part easy. If you've done a good job floating, you're going to get whole tile layout. You're going to have nice flat surfaces. The tile should just go in like butter. And this is a great example of a... Uh, of a pool where the, uh, the this edge here was set to a specific dimension and this all ended up being whole tile layout perfectly around this top here and for that reason and the seats were floated to the right dimensions to get whole tile layout and essentially no cuts but you can see here they had to do multiple layers of, of mortar bed so anytime you need to do more than about three quarters of an inch of mortar bed you might need to do multiple lifts and so the way you do that is your first lift is a scratch coat and that's the same thing you have that bond coat that goes on uh, your mortar bed goes up but then you scratch it uh, with either a scratching tool or a quarter inch notch trial. You rough it up so you got a nice mechanical uh, bondable surface there. And then once that's dry, you come back later and you do your brown coat uh, where you're just you're doing a nice flat brown coat to the dimension you actually need. So that's like I said, it's not necessary every case. It's only if you have a, a thicker mortar bed, which is a little harder to do in one shot because it starts to fall off the wall. Um, so again, talking about whole tile, talking about dimensions, a good mortar float is... Um, I'm going to say it's hard to do. It, it's uh, it's a simple concept that's often hard to uh, execute. But there are, are ways to get creative, uh, to come up with really good solutions and elegant solutions to create uh, really spectacular projects. So this is an example, kind of a small scale example of a creative solution to a problem. So this was a fountain, circular fountain, uh, a little bit uh, lower in the middle. Water is going to fill this bowl and then eventually flow over this edge. So you had to float uh, a perfectly level uh, edge that's rounded and is uh, consistently rounded because if it's not, it's not going to flow at the same speed in every spot. So a little bit of a challenge to do kind of conceptually, but what, I thought this was a brilliant installation. Uh, the This pad here was floated flat and perfectly level all the way around. Uh, and then they created this jig with a pin right off the center of this, uh, this, this uh, bowl. And then they used uh, a roller skate wheel essentially and this form to create this perfect round, uh, level, consistent uh, mortar bed. And once you had this jig built, actually floating this was actually pretty easy. Um, you could also look at this and say, all right, well, once this is done, I'm going to use the same jig. I'm going to continue this form and I'm going to put in whatever shape I want here. Maybe this is a little bit of a, a round shape here. You could put another piece of plywood and then continue your float all the way around, uh, obviously working around your, your plumbing. But it, you could get a uh, off this one jig that little time spent would make floating the rest of this almost simple uh, i also want you to pay attention here this where they put this whole joint in this mortar uh that's going to end up being a movement joint which i show you later in the presentation i just want you kind of a, a visual uh, snapshot memory memory snapshot of that so when i talk about that you you know what i'm talking about with mosaics you don't need to also think about transitions uh, and the radius it transitions from walls to floors around the outside of steps uh, a smaller tile can deal with a smaller radius, but you have a bigger tile, you might need a bigger radius. Well, how do you do that and do it consistently? Con consistently, the, the easiest way, in my opinion, is just to cut radius, uh, cut radius templates and use those templates to, to hand jig around those corners and get nice transitions from wall to floor uh, and nice and consistent. So once you get your floor floated and your wall floated, you can then use your hand uh, jig to go across that and you're screeding off essentially set mortar up here and set mortar down here. And as long as these two edges are making contact, you're getting a nice consistent float all the way through. And you can use that to come around these corners and do some really complicated shapes and do it really nicely. And the same thing with stairs. Uh, if you need to, if you're wrapping corners, just cut a jig, um, float the flats first, get these plumb, right? Let this set up a little bit. And then now you can use this edge coming off a little bit of set mortar and then have fresh mortar on the corner that you're just screening with this radius edge and all your corners will be absolutely perfect. So uh, just attention to detail. And that's, this is not specific to glass tile, but sometimes with glass tile, um, <clears throat> these details become more important because actually working with the materials gets a little more challenging and doing cuts and that type of thing. So 
having these transition details thought about and done well ahead of time uh, definitely makes life a lot simpler. All right, so this is that uh, that job that had that tent over it, and I said there are going to be a lot of photos of this one because it's it's such a, a an interesting project, and I think is a great example of what you can do with a little bit of ingenuity and forethought, and uh, and how the tile installation actually becomes simple once you do a good job floating. So this project was just a big circular pool. Uh, it's all single depth. Uh, there's going to end up being a medallion in here, but you got tile up and over. You have an infinity edge going down the back side of this wall. So how do you float? Uh, a perfectly circle and plumb wall, right? Concentric circle, plumb wall, and then a, a concentric circle, uh, infinity edge, which is actually a unique shape. I'll show you a photo of that coming up. Well, this was an ingenious solution in my opinion. So they, they dropped a pen here in the, in the middle of this, uh, got it, you know, dead center as close as they could. They floated this floor perfectly uh, flat and level. It's a single depth all the way across this pool. So, um, they nice flat level floor and then they created this jig and they put rollers on it they nice steel framing made it nice and strong and basically once they got this arm up here you had a plumb level arm that you could swing around and use to float the entire inside of this this pool so that whole pool was floated off this center or the whole wall excuse me was floated off the center point using that plumb arm on this jig then once that was done they could come up over here and create this structure and come up over the top and use that to float the infinity edge. And you could create this nice form on this, this nice shape. So this is sitting right on top. You got a nice, per, now you have a perfectly level edge being formed. You have a consistent shape to your infinity edge being formed. And this is perfect dimensions from the inside to the outside of this wall, because it's all again floated off that center point. It's all being referenced off the same point. So uh, once this was done, this is a very complex project obviously, but once this float was done, the tile installation actually became fairly simple because the hard work was done, your dimensions were set, things were set up for you for success. And here's what that edge looked like once it was once it was completed. Um, just and you should see, you'll, you'll see it with tile on it. It's even even more spectacular. Tile and water flowing over it. It's pretty amazing. All right, so now we're going to talk about the secondary waterproofing, which is the waterproofing that goes on top of your mortar bed. So your primary waterproofing on the tank, you bond a mortar bed, and now you have your secondary waterproofing to worry about. Um, well, if we already have a wa wa primary waterproofing, why are we worrying about a secondary waterproofing? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Mainly, we're worried about flexibility. We want to add a little more flexibility behind the tile to help with movement so things don't crack the tile. We also do want to protect the mortar bed a little bit, especially if you're in a freestyle area. The less water you have in your mortar bed, the better. Uh, even when you go to winterize, um, if you don't completely dry out a mortar bed, if it freezes, it can sp split apart. So keeping water out of your mortar bed is never a bad thing. Um, but there's some nuance to uh, what types of secondary waterproofing you should use and what applications. So there's generally two types, two categories of secondary waterproofings. There's your SBR rubber types that just come straight out of a bucket. Um, that would be your custom building products, RedGuard, HydroBan, uh, HydroFlex. These are just the, the, the brightly colored ones you're familiar with. You pop the top off the, top, off the bucket, you scoop it out. It looks like uh, a, a thick liquid and then you can roll it or trowel it onto the surface. Um, then you have your cementitious types, which would be the second list there. Hydroman cementitious, Miracote, Membrane C, Basecrete. And these are powders you mix with a liquid additive. And the difference between these is not just how you use them and apply them, but also where you can use them. So the, the first list I gave, the Red Guard, Hydrobands, and Hydroflex, those are SBR rubber types. Those can only be used if you're doing an entire vessel pool. And the reason is they do not do well when the water gets behind them. So you can imagine, see this water line here. Uh, if I were using the secondary waterproofing here, some water can still get behind that. Uh, the cementitious products are somewhat breathable. So when water gets behind that, it's not a big deal. It can breathe out. It's not a problem. They're not going to lose bond. Those other ones are not breathable. Those liquid SBR rubbers are not breathable. A little moisture gets behind them. It can cause issues with losing bond with the, the substrate. It can get bubbling, peeling. Uh, it can be problematic. So the manufacturers recommend those types of products only if you're doing an all-tile vessel. Or that second list, that's cementitious, they can be used for partial coverage or for full coverage if you're doing an all-tile vessel. So just a little nuance there. We have that all broken down in our instructions, and obviously each of these manufacturers uh, will have recommendations as well. Okay, and this is a, an example of one of those. It's obviously Red Guard from Custom Building Products. Uh, but again, this is an all-tile pool. There's no reason you can't use it. They're not lesser products. They just have a little bit of uh, limitation in the applications in which you can use them. Uh, another all-tile pool, this is the Laticrete Hydroban. I can tell because of the color. Uh, here you can see the walls are all waterproofed and after they've been floated, but now they're floating the floor. And once they're done floating the floor and it's cured, then they'll go ahead and waterproof that as well. And it'll all be 
one seamless application of waterproofing. Uh, and again, they can use that product because it's an all tile vessel. So here we're going to talk a little bit about tile installation. And I mainly focus on paper face mosaics and translucent tile because that's kind of the, the pinnacle, the most difficult thing to do. And if you can do that and you understand the concepts of that, everything else besides that is a little bit uh, simpler. I'm not going to say easier. It's simpler because there's fewer uh, considerations or complications. So we'll talk a little bit about the materials you should be using. Uh, we'll, I'll show you a video of paper face installation process. I normally do that hands on after the class. But thanks to our friend, Mr. COVID, that's not an option and we're on the internet. So I'm going to show you a little video. Uh, it's the actual installation process. And then we're also going to talk about cutting paper face mosaics. Again, same thing. I'm going to show you a video. Normally I do it hands on, let you guys actually play with the saw, but we can't do that this year. So uh, we're, we're going to have to settle for the internet's next best thing. So first let's talk about materials. Um, with glass tile, generally speaking, you're going to be using a modified thin set. Uh, there are instances where you can use epoxy, but there's so many nuances there. It's so complicated. I can't, I can't get into that here and give you any sort of comfort with that. What I am going to say is you're going to be using a modified thin set, usually uh, ANSI 118.4, 118.5. We have specific products we recommend. And what we recommend may differ depending on if you're working with a translucent tile or not. So um, obviously with translucent tile, you need to more worry about more than just white or gray. Those are still options for you. You can install a translucent tile with gray thin set if that's what you want and that's what the customer likes the way it looks. But generally speaking, it's going to be white with translucent tile. But you also need to be worried about the whiteness of the tile. There are now specific thin sets made for translucent tile and they tend to be whiter. They use whitening agents in them and they tend to be more consistently white. And that's another thing you need to worry about. Um, on a big job, an all tile pool with translucent tile, if you have a bag of thin set from a different batch um, and it's a slightly different color, that could be a problem. You can end up with a patchwork of different batches of thin set. So is your thin set color controlled from bag to bag? Is that something that you can do? There are thin sets available that are very consistent from bag to bag and the manufacturers will warranty them. Uh, there are others that are totally fine for glass tile installation in terms of bond strength and flexibility, but they're not very color consistent. So. Um, that's just something to be aware of as you're, you're making your selection for your materials. And our, our instructions do break it down, and I think a lot of other manufacturers do as well. These are the things that you, you should use, especially uh, with translucent tile, and then maybe with opaque tile, you have additional options where color isn't as much of a concern. Okay, uh, measure liquid and powder. And this is normally where I turn around and look at the installers in the crowd, and they all snicker at me like, oh, okay, sure, because uh, they've never measured their liquid and powder. And I get it. I'm a tile installer. I didn't either. And what I can tell you is these newer thin sets, they have additives in them that are lightweight. They use different types of fillers. It is a lot easier to under or over water these thin sets now than it was uh, when I was installing in the field 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, we used to be able to just reliably go on the look of the thin set, the sound of the drill, the way it felt, uh, and you'd mix up consistent thin set every time. I would say, especially the first time you use a new thin set, Please, please, please go the extra step, measure the liquid and powder. If you're mixing a full bag, it's really easy because you just, you know, get a big measuring cup from, you know, Home Depot and measure out how many, however many quarts it says. If you're not mixing a full bag, you know, cut it in half, put them, put them in a couple of buckets, eyeball it so that it's somewhat level and then measure the water. I'm not saying go get a scientific scale, but do something to control the level of water, um, the liquid to powder, because it's, it's hard, excuse me, it's easy to mess up with these new thin sets and it's extremely important in terms of your thin set consistency, color, bond strength, all those things. Um, machine mix, uh, you know, you want to get a good consistent mix. Mixing by hand is hard to get it mixed well enough, but don't over mix it. Don't use a super fast drill. You don't want to whip air into it. Um, re refer to the manufacturer's recommendations. There's the odd thin set out there that occasionally they do want actually a high speed. It's different cement technology, but most of the thin sets you guys are probably familiar with are, are going to be uh, low RPM mixers. Uh, and then slake and remix again. I was an installer. I was a helper. We never did this. It seemed like a waste of time and I didn't understand it. But now that I talked to the thin set manufacturers, I really do. And it's an easy step. There are things in installation that are hard to do. This is not one of them. Slake your thin set. Let it sit for five to 10 minutes, then remix it. And then once it's, when you're using it, if it starts to go off and it's dying on you, don't throw more water in it. You're, you're ruining your thin set and you're going to potentially cause yourself problems. It's just not worth saving the extra, you know, $5 worth of, of thin set that's in the bucket scoop it out, throw it away, mix a new batch. And then cure per the re manufacturer's recommendations. We'll talk about curing before uh, expo water exposure, but uh, there's a wide range of products out there from rapid setting to, you know, different products that, you know, three to 28 days is the range. So 
like I said, normally we do a, uh, a hands-on installation training uh, with Paperface Mosaics, but we can't do that. So here's a little video on the installation process. Now keep in mind, we're showing a, a backsplash in this video, uh, which I know it's backsplash, it's not a pool. It, it doesn't matter. The technique for the installation of the product, imagine it's on a pool wall and the pool is prepared exactly the way we just showed it. The tile would go in in the exact same manner. So here you go. Use the flat side of a trowel and firmly spread a small amount of thin set on the wall. This ensures a good bond to the substrate. Next, add additional thinset and use a 3 16 by quarter inch V-notch trowel to comb full notches in one direction. Use the flat side of the trowel to flatten the notches and achieve a smooth, consistent setting bed. This will help ensure 100% thinset contact and eliminate the appearance of notch marks behind the tile. During flattening, use light pressure and try to avoid removing thinset. Place the sheets into the thinset with firm, even pressure. If thinset has been on the wall for more than a few minutes, it's a good idea to make sure it hasn't skinned over. To do this, lightly touch the thinset. If the thinset is still tacky and a small amount transfers to your finger, it is still good. If your finger comes off clean, the thinset has sat too long and skinned over. If skinning occurs, the thinset will need to be removed from the wall and thrown away, so don't spread more than a few sheets worth at a time. After setting a few sheets, tap them with a wooden beating block and a small finish hammer. This will help ensure a good bond between the tile and the thinset and achieve the flattest possible installation. Do not use a rubber grout float or steel trowel for this step. They both tend to be too flexible to consistently bed the tile. About 15 to 30 minutes after the tile is installed, begin lightly wetting the paper with a damp sponge. The key is to keep the paper wet by wiping several times over a 5 to 10 minute period. Do not allow the paper to dry out, but don't flood the installation with a dripping sponge. Once the paper has fully absorbed the water, the glue will release. Begin peeling from the corner. If the glue has released, the paper should peel away fairly easily. If the paper is pulling tile out of the thin set, wet the paper again and wait a few more minutes. The reason the mounting paper is removed while the thin set is still fresh is to allow for adjustment of individual mosaics. Oceanside glass tile is handmade and each piece will vary in shape and size. However, make adjustments with the goal of creating a consistent field of mosaics and the illusion that each mosaic was hand placed. Pay particular attention to the joints where sheets meet and adjust the tile as needed to eliminate sheet lines. A common mistake with paper face mosaics is leaving the paper on until the thin set has fully dried which eliminates the opportunity to adjust the tile and quite often leads to the appearance of obvious sheet lines. So pull the paper as you go and make adjustments. You'll get a much better finished product. There will be a little glue left on the surface of the tile at this point, but don't worry about it. That will be cleaned off in a later step. If the glue residue is sticky and interferes with making adjustments, just wet your finger prior to adjusting the tile. Okay, so you see there, we, we showed flattening the trowel marks and uh, gauging the thin set with the trowel, right size trowel, flattening the trowel marks, uh, really important, particularly with translucent tile. And this is the reason, this is, this is what you can end up with if you don't do that. These are trowel marks that are visible through translucent tile. Not only is this unsightly now, but down the road, if you uh, get water in this, you get some water buildup on the tile, you can start to collect junk back there. And that's probably a spot where you're gonna get algae and mold growth, uh, which is really unsightly and very difficult to deal with without a total rip out and redo. Uh, here's another spot where again, just inconsistent thin set coverage. Um, you can see a little bit of trail marks, but also just empty spots. Home, homeowner may or may not notice that now, but when I when that's a, a big black spot of mold, I guarantee you you're gonna get a phone call and it's, it's not a comfortable conversation. So, uh, it, those extra steps, making sure you have 100% thin set coverage, uh, really important with translucent tile. Uh, thin set color, again, this is just an example of thin set color variation. Uh, we had a phone call from a company saying, hey, you sent us two different batches of tile. It's very clearly, you know, two different color tiles. Happened to be local, so we went down there and uh, took a look and we're like, well, yeah, there's definitely two different colors there, but is it the tile or is it the thin set? So. We actually knocked out a few and lo and behold, oh, look at that. That thin set on the top section was completely darker, totally different color. Same product, um, just from a different bag, uh, according to them. And, uh, you know, we took these tiles out, cleaned them up, compared the tile on a, a consistent white background. The tile was the exact same color. It was all from the same batch. There was no, no color issues with the tile, 100% thin set issues. So translucent tile, just a couple more things to be considerate of and something to keep an eye on. 
So, all right, so now let's uh, go on the paper face cutting mosaic. So paper face mounted, as I mentioned when we were talking about the mounting methods, paper face, there's a learning curve to it. And one of the things you have to think about is cutting. Uh, it's held together with water soluble glue and you cannot dry cut glass. That, that's if, just a really bad idea. You're gonna get a chipped edge. You could crack tiles by overheating it. You wanna wet cut it. Well, how do you wet cut it when it's held together with water soluble glue? We developed just from the just from the, the pure standpoint of wanting to go faster, doing jobs ourselves, we developed a way to cut paper face mosaics uh, on a wet saw and it works really well. Uh, so here you go. Glass tile should be cut with a wet tile saw equipped with a continuous ram diamond blade that is made specifically for cutting glass tile. Because paper face mosaics are mounted with water soluble glue, wet cutting a full sheet requires a little setup on the saw. First, cover the saw tray with a piece of quarter inch tile backer board and raise the saw head so the blade only cuts through half the board thickness. This will give you a solid, consistent support for the small mosaic tile. Dress the saw blade by cutting a 60 grit dressing stone, which will expose the abrasive diamond in the blade edge. Periodically dressing the blade will promote efficient, chip-free cutting. Next, cut another piece of tile backer board to a dimension that is slightly larger than a sheet of mosaics. Along one edge of this second board, install a strip of self-adhesive compressible foam weather strip. Place the tile sheet on the covered saw tray with paper side up and align the cut line with the blade. Lay the second board on top of the mosaic sheet covering the side of the cut that is going to be used. Make sure the weather strip side is down and against the blade. The board and weather strip will protect the sheet from saw overspray and keep the paper dry. Apply enough downward pressure to compress the weather strip, which will prevent water from flowing under the board and stabilize the mosaic during cutting. Turn off the saw, carefully remove the top board and towel dry the mounting paper. Flip the sheet over on a dry flat surface and towel dry the back of the tile prior to installation. All right, so that technique works awesome for uh, uh, for straight cuts, for angle cuts. You can do the inside of skimmer boxes, all that stuff. You can get really, really, really fine detail on the cuts, uh, and, and it works great. So uh, it, once you get that setup done on the front end with the with the cover of the tray and your your weather strip foam on the board, you know we'll use that same setup for a couple of jobs, and then it gets beat up, and it's just cheap material. So you replace it when it starts to get a little beat up and worn out, and you go on. Uh, so it, it works really well. Try it out. Um, Okay, so movement joints. Um, movement joints can be a controversial subject, depending on who you talk to about them. And the reason is that uh, I think especially a number of years ago, there were some less scrupulous manufacturers who were using movement joints as a catch-all reason for failures. And I think in some cases, uh, there were failures that were due to poor quality product, um, that uh, poor quality manufactured product that ended up getting blamed on installers because they said, oh, you didn't put in movement joints, have a nice day. And now anytime I bring up movement joints with a room full of installers, there's always one guy who scoffs a little bit and says, yeah, that's just a CYA manufacturer thing. Well, I, I promise you it's not. If you're that guy scoffing, hear me out. Glass expands and contracts more than porcelain or ceramic. So we need to include movement joints in our conversation, uh, even more so than with other materials. Um, but we can have that conversation and have it in a way that's reasonable and has uh, actual science behind it and, and understanding. So I'm not just going to hold you to the letter of the law on movement joints and say you got to put them every eight feet everywhere. You got to do this to do that. Uh, we have very specific guidance and, and it's based, try to based again in science and reason and what's actually achievable in the field. So what we do recommend movement joints is at the perimeter joint here. And this, again, you have coping, you have change in plane, you have this getting exposed to the sun up here, this is underwater, you have a lot of differential movement here. So really important that you have a nice true movement joint here with a full gap and back rod and sealant. We'll show you actually how to do that in great detail here in a moment. We do want movement joints at inside corners. It's really easy to do to just create a movement joint in inside corners. Uh, it doesn't cause problems with your, your, your installation aesthetically. Um, we do also want installation in tile work every eight foot on center. Now, this is where we have a conversation about where it's actually needed and it's not. So there are two environment, distinct environments in a pool. You have above the water line and below the water line. Below the water line is generally very stable. It, water temperature is fairly consistent. It doesn't heat up too much in the summer. It doesn't cool off too much in the winter. Hopefully you're, you're winterizing or heating the pool if you're in an area that freezes. It's a very narrow temperature range compared to 
the outside of the negative edge, right? Negative edge, you get solar gain, it's sitting in the sun, it heats up during the day. It's 95 degrees during the day, it's in the sun. That surface can be 150, you know, degrees or plus. Um, and then you got the wintertime low, it's freezing outside, right? That's the range it sees, where the bottom of your pool that's underwater doesn't see anywhere near that type of range because it's got five feet of water above it. So do you need, uh, if you have an all-tile pool, do you need movement joints every eight feet on the bottom of the pool? No, you don't. Uh, you, you don't probably don't need any movement joints in the bottom of that pool other than the corners if you have inside corners uh, where the wall meets the floor. But you need to keep in mind if that pool ever gets drained or before it gets filled, you need to keep that pool shaded because if that floor expands in the heat of the sun and it's got nowhere to go, it's going to tent. And I've actually seen that with pools that were fine, beautiful installations, five, six years old, nothing wrong with it. Pool water chemistry has an issue. They decide they're going to change the water out, so they drain the pool. They leave it uncovered and the whole floor lifts up. Bang, you got a failure. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But the outside of an infinity edge is a different deal. You need movement joints every eight feet. And that movement joint's going to be uh, cut into the tile and you need backer rod or bond breaker tape in there behind it. And we'll show you, I'm going to show you detail on like I said on that sealant. And there's a very specific reason why you need that bond breaker tape or backer rod in there to have your joint uh, function properly. Um, all right, so let's show you, show you some detail on that. So this is, imagine this is that wall we, we showed earlier in the floating, but in here we're also going to be thinking about the movement joint at the coping. So uh, the way we create do that is by creating a gap there, using a little bit of spacer. This is just a styrofoam spacer. I think it's a quarter inch, had some uh, f uh, form release on it, so the mortar just didn't stick to it at all. Uh, and it was just kind of held up there, uh, loose, while the mud got in there, and the mud holds it up in place. And then once that mud's set up, you can pull it out. And when you pull it out, you get a nice gap. Um, and there's a nice consistent quarter inch gap all the way through the, the thickness of the mortar bed behind the coping. Uh, once your tile's installed, again, this is just a porcelain tile, but this, it, honestly, this doesn't matter. This is just cool tile installation, good practices. The backer rod goes into that gap. Now, this backer rod is a closed cell foam. That's important. Uh, you want to use closed cell because you don't actually want the sealant to bond to the backer rod. You want it to stick to the coping. And you want it to stick to the top of the tile. And the reason for that is when a movement joint moves, it needs to be able to stretch and get thinner in the middle. So imagine a rubber band, if you're holding it, uh, you cut it so it's flat open, you hold each end but with your thumbs and you pull it apart. The middle of that rubber band is gonna get thinner as you stretch it apart, right? Now if you take it and you take one of the flat sides of the rubber band and you glue it down to a table, now you try to grab the ends and pull it, you can't stretch it. It, it doesn't move because it can't get thinner and it can't stretch. Well, that's what you're doing uh, with this joint here is you're only uh, adhering the ends of the sealant joint by gluing to the bottom of the coping and the top of the tile, and it's not going to stick to the actual backer rod. So the other important thing is the backer rod itself is uh, a little bit bigger than the gap. This is a 3 8 inch backer rod going into a quarter inch gap. That way when you press it in, it compresses a little and it stays at the depth you put it. So it doesn't just fall in the gap. It doesn't, you know, move around. It stays right where you put it. And then you put your sealant over the top of it and uh, tool that off nice. And you have a really high performing joint there. Um, if you ever see a sealant joint that's torn over after the years, probably because they didn't get to do a good job with a backer here and they have it adhered to all three sides. What eventually happens is it's trying to stretch. It can, it can't. So it just peels away from one side or the other, either the, uh, the coping or the tile and you get a torn joint that has to be redone. Uh, I've done coping joints like this that have been installed for seven, eight years. Uh, gone back and looked at them and they're just, they're perfect. Use hundred percent silicone or high performance uh, sealant there as color matched the grout. And you just, it's, I don't know. I won't say it's perfect, but it's bulletproof. It's pretty solid. So again, inside corners, just an easy spot to do it. Uh, if you don't have a full gap for a backer rod, you can also use bond breaker tape, which does the same thing. It's just a very, very thin layer of a clear tape that you can push down into the joint that uh, has a has a layer on it. Think of it like the back of the, 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 the layer that goes on like a back of stickers that nothing will stick to it. That's what bond breaker tape is. Um, so your sealant can go over it and it doesn't bond to the substrate, just bonds to the two sides of the tile. And then uh, here's that, that fountain I mentioned earlier. I told you to make a mental note of that mortar bed. So they stopped that mortar bed there and they kept a full depth joint that went actually through, this, through the full thickness of the tile and the mortar bed here before they completed their float over here. So this is a movement joint and they did it at a spot right where the water is going to be transitioning hot and cold. They're able to put movement joints actually in here in some of these red stripes as well. So it's, it's uh, not as visible in their design. They didn't have to cut a joint through the tile here that could kind of keep things consistent. So a little bit of thought and, and planning and forethought in your design, uh, you can make movement joints not too obtrusive and, uh, and and actually make them look like a nice part of the design. All right, so post-installation curing. Uh, this is pretty simple. Whatever the environment was that you're, you're installing in, that's what you want to try to maintain through 
the full cure of the installation. The thin sets and grouts need to reach full cure uh, before you expose them to freezing weather, heavy moisture, those types of things. So if you had the job tented and fully protected while you're installing, chances are you're going to want to leave that through the cure. And that, that can range from three to 28 days, depending on what materials you're using. Why is that important? Well, if you expose that thin, those thin sets and grouts to moisture too soon, all those uh, polymers that are in them, they're highly modified. You can start to leach them out. You can cause problems. And with translucent tile, now you're starting to talk about color problems. That's a big deal. Uh, here's a job. They probably probably looked great when they were done. I walked away and thought, oh man, look at this beautiful pool. Took their tent down, went, went, went home. Well, within the next week, they got rain. They got freezing weather overnight. Uh, you can see the water in the deep end of this thing. It was just not protected at all. And the thin set changed colors. And it changed colors behind the tile in an irregular way because you had different you know different stages of curing different levels of exposure to moisture and uh yeah this was a total rip out and redo um and uh, purely because they just didn't have it protected when it was going through its curing phase really simple and easy thing to do really expensive mistake all right maintenance uh one of the things i want to point on with maintenance keep this really f quick and easy uh we do have a pool time maintenance guide i'll hopefully include that in some sort of digital handout or download for you guys uh, so you can refer to that, goes through startup, maintenance, all that kind of stuff. What I want you to really consider, though, this high level, take one thing away from the maintenance section, acid is bad for iridescent tile. Iridizing on glass tile is just basically a thin layer of metal in the surface, and strong acids, including some of the commercial pool tile cleaners that are out there, will take the iridizing right off the surface. You can see these drip marks that are black. Those aren't supposed to be there. That's black glass that's being exposed. The iridizing has been removed. That was an off-the-shelf cleaner from a, uh, from a pool supply company. Um, and this was a very expensive insurance claim for a, a pool tile maintenance person uh, on this job. So acid is bad. Refer to the, the pool tile maintenance guide for, uh, for more details. All right, so now let's look at some pretty pictures. This is the fun part. So I think this is the, yeah, this is the one we showed in the quarter round. Uh, this is an older job, pretty simple. Um, it, you know, raised bombing, water line, spillway. I think we showed photos of this, the, uh, the, the inside corner and the, the miter in the quarter round there quarter round detail this is actually the completed job this is a job we there we showed the red guard uh on that house uh there's actually a window from the house that looks into this pool uh which is why it was really important to get waterproofing on on this pool in particular but uh yeah really nice really nice job just a lot of a lot of edge detail a lot of quarter round a lot of trim uh pretty cool project this is a pretty spectacular uh, Baja shelf. It's massive. I think the whole thing's on between six inches and a foot deep. And it's just a big, massive, flat Baja shelf area where you can set up like a temporary bar. You can set up lounge tables. And you can basically, when it's not COVID, you can have a giant party. So uh, I kind of wish I was there right now. More pretty iridescent tile. I just, I love this stuff in the sun. Just hard to, hard to duplicate that look with any other type of material. All right, one of my favorite jobs. This is uh, this is actually a professional baseball player's house in Arizona, um, uh, done by Luke and Amy Denning, some uh, really good tile installers and uh, and friends. Uh, and I don't know this for sure. I think I talked about remounting earlier. Um, about you know you can do work with remounting steps. I, I just knowing Luke and Amy, I don't know this for sure, but I, I'm pretty sure if I had to bet money, I bet they remounted this section of these steps where the, these cut pieces here and the wedges they made coming out here. My guess is they did that in uh, in their shop, uh, you know, on a workbench with a saw right next to them where it was easy just to lay it out. They glued it face down onto a piece of paper uh, and then using the template, you know, they got a perfect size. So when they come out to the job, they throw this corner in, set it, and then they work their way off the corner and it's just, it's just perfect. And all that hard work and detail work is done in a nice and contr controlled environment where it's uh, a little easier to do. And then this is a Greg Andrews pool, which just has some a lot of spectacular details. Here's a little swim out from the house, which is really cool. Uh, but I really want to focus on this as the transitions. You know, we talked about earlier about getting the nice curved transitions uh, with your float. But what that leads to with your tile installation is it also gives you a really nice way to make these transitions clean from the floor to the ceiling. And I love the way he does this from the floor to the ceiling because it, from two feet away, especially full of water, it just disappears and it looks like a seamless installation. And this is a, a straight set grid tile. Think about this being a straight set tile, square joints, square joints on the wall, square joints on the floor and curved corners and irregular shapes. And how do you make that look decent? And uh, th that's how he does it. He treats it like a Roman tub, top down on the walls, center out on the floors, make your transitions and make your cuts in the corners where they hide. Uh, and it ends up just being mm, just beautiful.
uh, just absolutely spectacular installation. And here, once again, is that big pool that was done with the tent and the, the circular float system. I just, just want to show you some images of it all done with the medallion and the overflow full of water. Just, again, amazing. And here's that edge, that infinity edge that they floated off the center uh, with water and the tile. That, that shape on there just would have been really difficult to achieve if they had floated it any other way. Um, again, and again, the tile installation, once they had that float down, I would imagine, was fairly straightforward. It's just, you know strips of offset tile and it, it rolled consistently. Well, there you go, everybody. I appreciate you hanging out with me. Thanks for sticking through the presentation. I hope you learned something valuable. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at tech support at glass tile.com or go directly to our installation resources page at installogt.com where you can in download all of our installation instructions, including the pool and water feature installation guide. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.